if you know for yourself that we serve a wonderful God, put those hands together one more time. Grace and peace be unto you through God our Father and Jesus Christ our Son, his Son. Uh, I feel like Peter who went on the Mount of Transfiguration uh, said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Uh, what an honor and a privilege it is to come back home. Amen. The place where I commenced my ministry. and had the wonderful opportunity of serving such wonderful people such as yourselves. Antioch let me both hustle and hasten to truly express my sincere attitude of gratitude for all of the support and love that you have shown myself and my family as the Lord has called us to the beautiful city of Tampa, Florida. On tonight, uh, let's put our hands together for this marvelous ministry of music. God bless you. God bless you. I truly want to acknowledge, honor, and thank God for my preaching partners for the week, Reverend Drake and Reverend Gaines. Amen. God bless you all. The last time that the three of us were together was actually at my installation. And so I, I say that to say, I realize that this is the homecoming revival. Uh, but if you ask our wives, our wives may say that this is the reunion of the three stooges. Amen. 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 And, and just for the record, uh, Reverend Drake, let me say this publicly, uh, that Reverend Gaines is my dude too. He's, he's my dude too. Amen. Uh, some, some of you may not know, uh, but Reverend Gaines has, uh, there haven't been many Sundays uh, that I've mounted the pulpit at the Beulah Baptist Institutional Church uh, where Reverend Gaines hasn't been there in support. I appreciate you, brother. Amen. God bless you. What a joy it is to see such beautiful and handsome faces on tonight. And I do want to thank Deaconess Marilyn Crowther for, uh, the, for extending the invitation and amen. There she is, amen, amen. Uh, Antioch, let, let me share this quick story with you. Um, in the month of September, um, I did a series at Beulah entitled The G Factor. And so I chuckled to myself because um, after the fourth Sunday, after the fourth installment of the G Factor, uh, Deaconess Crowther and I, we had been in contact one with another prior to that. Uh, but she emailed me that Monday morning and she said, uh, uh, Reverend Harris, we have set aside 30 minutes uh, for preaching. Are you sure that's going to be enough for you? Amen. And, and so Antioch, I had to chuckle at myself once again when she sent me the final uh, plans for the week and I see that she increased my time. Thank you, God bless you, God bless you. Beloved, would you journey with me to the book of Nehemiah, the ninth chapter of the book of Nehemiah and I want to read in your hearing verses one through three. Nehemiah chapter nine. And I want to read in your hearing verses one through three. Let me know that you've arrived at the book of Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, by simply saying, I've got it. Amen. Reading from the New Living Translation, you will find these words. On October 31st, 
the people assembled again. And this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours, they confessed their sins and worshiped the Lord their God. On, the 30, on October 31st, the people assembled again and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. I realize that tonight's theme is revival, but I wanna expand that just a little bit tonight. And for a few minutes with your prayers, I wanna tag this text in our exchange, requirements for rebuilding and revival. Requirements for rebuilding and revival. Beloved, it was once said that a tree can spark an entire forest. And the fact that a tree can spark an entire forest ought to remind each and every one of us about the power and the significance of one. That is to say that God doesn't always need a big group of people, but sometimes God only needs one individual who has the, who has the mentality of knowing that they can make a difference. And we ought to just be honest tonight, my brothers and my sisters, that one of the reasons we're able to sit in the comfort of padded pews is because some of our ancestors and our forefathers, they knew about the power of one. And so it is because they knew about the power of one, they engaged in various boycotts. They took place in various sit-ins because they truly believed from the bottom of their heart about the power of one. And this, my brothers and sisters, is one of the many lessons that we learn from the life and the ministry of Nehemiah. For when we take time to read the book of Nehemiah and when we study the life of Nehemiah, we quickly see one individual who made a major difference. And one of the reasons that I love the book of Nehemiah is because when we look at the book of Nehemiah, we simply see two major themes in this book. If one were to perform an outline of the book of Nehemiah, we see in chapters one through seven, rebuilding from the people, rebuilding from the people, rebuilding by the people. The people of God are rebuilding the wall. But after we see the rebuilding by the people, secondly, we see, we see the revival of the people, revival of the people. The people have come together to be revived by God. And so it is, my brothers and sisters, Nehemiah, as we see the rebuilding by the people and we see the revival of the people, Nehemiah gives us some requirements that, that are needed as we engage in rebuilding and as we experience revival. And Antioch, because even though there are some things that change, you do know that there are many things that stay the same. And so I say that to say, let me give you three points on each of the major two movements, and I'll bid you farewell. <laughs> no, no, notice number one, 
Nehemiah teaches us that the first requirement as it relates to rebuilding is that we have to be able to discern the difference between an obstacle and an opportunity. The question becomes tonight, what is the major difference between an obstacle and an opportunity? Simply put, when one has the proper perspective, one has the proper perspective, one quickly realizes that an obstacle is one is dealing with a situation whereby progress might be impeded. But one realizes that one realizes also that even though an opportunity is therefore a chance whereby we can grow in spite of all that we have to go through. And so it is, I want to suggest tonight that when Nehemiah sees that the wall needs to be rebuilt, Nehemiah has the proper perspective because please understand, beloved, when the wall needs to be rebuilt, he does not see it as an obstacle, but rather he sees it as an opportunity. And it is amazing it, it fascinates me and intrigues me how two people can be looking at the same situation and they can see something totally different. Some of you, you, you heard the story about the two prisoners who looked through the prison bars. One looked and saw mud while the other prisoner looked and saw stars. I believe it was George Bernard Shaw who said there are some men who look at things and ask why. But he said he dreams of things that never were and ask why not. Isn't it amazing, beloved, that there are some people who can look at the same thing and one person will see a landmine, but somebody else will see a gold mine. Isn't it interesting tonight that there are some people who will look at something and one person will see the problem, but the other person will see the solution. There are individuals who they will look at the same situation and one people, one person will say it can't be done, but somebody else else will say it can be done. Somebody else, they'll look at a situation and they'll say that won't happen, but somebody else will look at it and say it will happen. And and this is the mentality that Nehemiah has. Nehemiah says, even though the wall needs to be rebuilt, it's it's not an obstacle, but it's an opportunity. And I see the looks on your faces tonight. You're saying, Pastor Harris, how do you know that Nehemiah embraced rebuilding the wall as an opportunity and not an obstacle? Can I tell you real quick why I like this and why I love this? Here's number one. Please understand tonight, Antioch, that the walls had been ruined in Jerusalem for 140 years. Y'all tracking with me tonight? In other words, because the walls had been ruined for 140 years, surely there were some other individuals in Jerusalem who probably thought to themselves that these walls need to be repaired. But the reason that Nehemiah goes down in history and the reason that we're talking about Nehemiah tonight is because Nehemiah didn't just talk about it, but Nehemiah was actually about it, about it. And I don't know about you tonight, but that's the mentality that God is looking for from all of us tonight. God says, I'm tired of saints who simply run their mouths. I'm tired of saints who simply look at things and don't want to solve the problem. But God says, I need some individuals who can say with God on my side, it doesn't matter how big the problem is. It doesn't matter how high the mountain is, because if God before me, he's more than the world against me. I like this because Nehemiah says that this isn't an obstacle, it's an opportunity. Can't you see some of the individuals in Jerusalem as Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall, talking amongst themselves and saying, well, I would have done it. (laughs) And, and, And don't you know, beloved, that even in 2022, 
that there are a lot of individuals who live in the woods. Individuals who say, I would go back to school if I could. I would lose weight if I could. I would stop cussing folk out if I could. I would do something differently. But Nehemiah reminds us that when we see situations as an opportunity and not an obstacle, we have to stop saying, I would, and we have to start saying, I will. I will go back to school. I will finish that degree. I will start exercising. I I will stop cussing folk out. Nehemiah says, somebody tonight, you need to stop hanging out in the woods. Stop, stop hanging out in the woods. But, but watch this, beloved. I, I like this because Nehemiah doesn't say, doesn't hang out in the woods, but I, I really like this. Because, come on, can, can we engage in the text for a couple minutes tonight? C can't you see it on the screens of your anointed imagination? Here it is. Pastor Nehemiah is having an All Saints meeting. And, and he's laying out the plans and the strategy for how the wall is going to be rebuilt. And if the people in Jerusalem Baptist Church are anything like some of the Negroes that are in every other Baptist church, if you listen closely enough in the meeting, you can hear some of the members of Jerusalem Baptist Church saying, uh, Brother Nehemiah, we never did it that way before. If you lean in close enough, you, you, you can hear some of the individuals saying, uh, pastor, uh, I, I know you're new in town, but, but the last pastor didn't lay bricks like that. If you lean in close enough, you can hear some of the members of the Jerusalem Baptist Church saying, I don't think it's going to work because we've never done that before. That's new here. But, but could it be tonight, Antioch? That God is saying to some of us tonight, you're absolutely correct. It's never been done that way before, but I'm raising people up in your presence because I'm trying to teach you that sometimes you have to do the unthinkable and do the unimaginable in order to reach the unreachable. And, and, and please understand, it, it, it really does not matter to me whether you choose to dwell in the past or look ahead to the future. I'm going back to Florida tomorrow morning. <laughs> Got my own pulpit to go back to. But, but might I suggest to anyone who's struggling to move out of the past and come into the future, might I remind you that we serve a God who operates in newness. That, that, that is to say that we serve a God who, even though he is not regulated or confined by time, because he himself controls time and is time eternal. We serve a God who is always looking and thinking ahead. You don't believe me? God calls us to see new things. That, that is why God told the children of Israel in Isaiah chapter 43, stop dwelling on the past, for I'm doing a new thing in the earth. That, that, that is why Jeremiah, when he was speaking about the mercies of God that keep us and sustain us, declared morning by morning, new mercies I see. That, that is why Micah wrote in Micah chapter 7 verse 8, we serve a God who throws our sins in the sea of forgetfulness and remembers them no more. 
That, that is why Paul, when talking about the salvation that we have in the Lord Christ Jesus, said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation for the old has passed and behold, all things have become new. That same Paul, when speaking about the stewardship that we have in Christ, said, for not that I've apprehended it, uh, forgetting that which lies behind and pressing toward that which lies ahead, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus and it was John the revelator who said in Revelation chapter 21 he said and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for behold the old earth has passed away and I'm just trying to simply suggest tonight that you ought to move from being stuck in the past and you ought to go ahead and look to your future because you will miss out on what God is trying to do in your life. And don't you know tonight that there are individuals who are dying a slow and miserable death, not because they're not in good health, but simply because they're stuck in the past. Don't you know there are churches that are declining at the drop of a dime because they're stuck in the past. But I wonder, are there any witnesses under the sound of my voice tonight who can say my past is my past and I'm looking towards the future. <laughs> Nehemiah says, listen. Ne Nehemiah says, number one, if we're going to rebuild, the first requirement is that we can discern between an obstacle and an opportunity. But can I give you the second principle? Nehemiah says, number two, the second requirement of rebuilding is that you have to be devoted in spite of opposition. Uh, maybe you didn't say amen on that point because you don't know what it's like to face opposition. When, when you read Nehemiah chapters four through six, we are introduced to some individuals who you all are familiar with Geshem, Tobiah, and Sanballat. They are all enemies of Nehemiah. And I believe it was Shakespeare who once said that trials never come in single battalions, but rather they, they don't come as single countrymen, but rather they come in battalions. And I would take Shakespeare's words and mix those a little bit and say that the same thing can be said of your enemies. Because rarely do you just have one enemy, but you got to deal with two or three enemies. I need to step on the gas. I'm preaching like I'm at Beulah. Listen. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you're currently dealing with an enemy in your life, I, I need you to do me a favor and write these three numbers down. Four, six, seven. That those are the numbers I need you to write down. Four, six, seven. Well, well, watch how four, six, and seven helps us handle our haters. In Nehemiah chapter four, as Sanballat comes and tries to raise heck in Nehemiah's life, there is a very interesting principle that Nehemiah gives unto us. For the text lets us know that after Sanballat comes for Nehemiah, Nehemiah prays for Sanballat. And just let me be honest with you tonight, Antioch. I commend Brother Nehemiah for praying for Sanballat. Because had that been my name in the text, it wouldn't have said P-R-A-Y, it would have said P-R-E-Y. Sanballat comes for Nehemiah, and Nehemiah prays for his opposition. And could it be tonight, beloved, that God is trying to teach us or at a minimum remind us that when opposition comes into our lives, that we don't have to BCC people on an email. 
we don't have to post negative stuff about them on social media, but all we've got to do is keep our hands clean and pray for them. In, in Nehemiah chapter four, he prays for him. But then in Nehemiah chapter six, Sanballat and his boys, they come for Nehemiah and they say, Nehemiah, we want to meet with you. If I had time, I'd talk about how your enemy never just wants to meet with you by themselves, but they want to bring their cronies. I'm, I'm, I promise I'm going back home tomorrow. I'm going back home tomorrow. And, 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 as, as, and as Nehemiah's opposition comes to him and say, we want to meet with you, you all remember what Nehemiah said? Nehemiah said, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down from the wall. Now, here's what we have to keep in mind, beloved. Sometimes when we're dealing with our enemies, when we tell them that we won't come down, it's not about switching our physical location, but rather sometimes we have to let our enemies know that I'm not coming down to your level of ignorance, that I'm not coming down to your level of pettiness, that I'm not coming down to your level of, dare I say it, not coming down to your level of stupidity. I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm preaching like I'm at Beulah. Nehemiah says when our enemies come in our way, we have to remind them that we're not going to stoop to their level. And, and here's what I find interesting, beloved. Notice the juxtaposition of Nehemiah and his enemies. Nehemiah is constructing, but his enemies are chatting. Nehemiah is doing the work of the Lord, but his enemies are thinking about how they can advance their own agenda. All right, let me just make it plain. Nehemiah is engaged in ministry, but his enemies are being messy. Come, come, come on. You, you all remember in Acts around the 29th chapter, uh, the Bible says that after Paul had a snake latched on to his wrist, that the same people that liked him in verse two were the same people waiting for him to die in verse four. I wish I had time to talk about how people will turn on you at the drop of a dime. But, but you all remember that story? And the text says something interesting. It, it said that, that, he, that Paul's enemies waited a long time waiting for Paul to die. So therefore, here's the question that I have as it relates to Nehemiah and his boys. As Nehemiah is engaged in ministry, but his enemies are being messy, the question becomes to Nehemiah's enemies, don't you have anything better to do with your time than to be messy? And I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but God is telling someone you need to tell your enemies, I cannot come down to your level. Well, what? watch this. Four, we pray for. Six, we tell them that we can't come down to their level. But here is the shouting news as it relates to the number of seven, the number seven. Because when you read Nehemiah, you will discover that Nehemiah faced opposition seven times. Ah, oh, come on, y'all, 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 y'all got Fridays on your brain. He, he faces opposition seven times. Why, why is that good news tonight? Well, think about this, beloved. The number seven in the Bible is the number of completion. Here it is. For anyone who's dealing with opposition in your life, there is some good news and some bad news. Let me give you the bad news first. The bad news is that anytime we are, anytime we are intentional about rebuilding, 
There are times that the reality is that we can't ghost Geshem. The, the reality is that we can't swerve San Ballot. The reality is that we can't terminate Tobiah. But the good news this morning, th this evening, is that there is an expiration date to how much hell your enemies bring in your life. <laughs> and, and when you know, when, when you know that there is an expiration date for the, for the heck that individuals bring in your life, you ought to just be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Here it is. Number one, if we're going to engage in rebuilding, we have to discern the difference between an obstacle and an opportunity. Number two, we have to be devoted in spite of opposition. But then lastly, we see that we also have to believe that God is going to deliver something outstanding. I, I promise I won't hang on on this point as long as I did my previous two points. If Nehemiah were here today and if we interviewed him, Nehemiah would tell us the reason he kept rebuilding the wall is because he knew once it was complete, it was going to be outstanding. <laughs> if Nehemiah were here today, Nehemiah would say, Nehemiah would tell us the reason that he went through all of those church meetings with devilish deacons and ugly acting ushers is because he knew that once the wall was completed, it was going to be outstanding. If Nehemiah were here today, Nehemiah would say, the reason I didn't put in my two weeks notice and the reason I didn't throw in the towel and wave the proverbial white flag is because I knew that God was going to deliver something outstanding. And, and, and here's the question that I have for my Antioch Baptist Church family how many of you know that even though you're currently in a season of transition, that God is going to deliver something outstanding? <laughs> How many of you all know that even in spite of what, where you are now, that your best days are not behind you, but your best days are in front of you? Who am I talking to tonight who can say the reason I'm not giving up and the reason I'm not giving in is because I believe for my own church that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love the Lord. If you know that God has an outstanding work for this particular church to do, why don't you just put those hands together and give God praise? He's going to deliver something outstanding. He's going to do something that only he can do. All right. Let me give you these three quick points as it relates to revival so I can be obedient as it relates to preaching on the theme. Let me give them to you real quickly. Here are the three requirements as it relates to experiencing revival. Number one. The text teaches us in Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, that if we're going to experience revival, then we first must repent. Can the church say repent? When, when you go home tonight and you read verses 1 and 2, you will see how the people of Israel, how they dress themselves in sackcloth. Sackcloth, symbolic of confessing their sins unto the Lord. And then in verse 2, it shows us how the Israelites separate themselves from the foreigners in Israel. Why do they separate themselves from the foreigners? It was because they realized that the foreigners had a proclivity and a propensity to draw them away from God. And so in an act of sacrifice and in an act of obedience, 
they say to themselves, we're going to leave these foreigners and return back to God. And that's the question that God is pressing on each and every one of our hearts tonight. God is saying on this, the last night of revival, what is it that you need to get away from? God is asking each and every one of us tonight, what is it you need to turn away from? And maybe God isn't asking, what do you need to turn away from? Maybe God is asking, who do you need to turn away from? Nehemiah says, number one, that if we're going to experience revival, we have to repent. But then Nehemiah says, number two, if we're going to experience revival, we have to revere God's word. I wish I had time to unpack that. Because in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 3, the text says that the people of God stood in reverence of God's word. And check this out, Antioch. It's right there in verse 3. It says that they listened to the word of God for three hours. For 180 minutes, they listened to the word of God. Some, some of you all are sitting here tonight and you're saying, man, I forgot how long Reverend Harris preaches. But, but notice how deep their reverence is for God's word. They stand up and they listen to God's word for three hours. And, and here's the question tonight. How much time do you spend in God's word? <laughs> Beloved, in one setting, they listen to the word of God for three hours. And if truth be told, some of us, if we don't even engage in the word of God for a in a complete year, but for one, in one setting, they engage in the word of God for three hours. How, how, much, how many days would it take for us to be at a point of saying we've engaged with God's word for three hours? It, it's interesting how we can watch a football game for four hours. But we say it's a long time when to engage in God's word for three hours. We, we can watch the real housewives of Potomac back to back to back. We can binge on Netflix for hours upon hours. But then when it comes to the word of God, we say it's a long time. No, no. Nehemiah says that if you want to experience revival, you have to have a reverence for his word. I'm, I'm almost done. Nehemiah teaches us, number one, that if we want to experience revival, we have to repent before God. We have to revere God's word. But then lastly, the text teaches us that we have to be intentional about rejoicing. That, that, that's another way of saying that we have to make praise a priority. Because once again, when you go back home, read chapter eight, which is the beginning of the revival in in the nation of Israel, specifically the city of Jerusalem. And we see one of the first things that Nehemiah does as he seeks to implement revival in the nation is he appoints the Levites to a very prominent position, the Levites who were in charge of worship. And when you continue to read Nehemiah chapter 9, you discover three reasons that Nehemiah tells us that we ought to praise God. Nehemiah tells us, number one, that we ought to praise God because of his name. 
And how many of you all know tonight that, yes, there are some good names and yes, there are some great names, but there is no name like the name of God. (laughs) Nehemiah shows us, number one, that we ought to praise God because of his name. But then Nehemiah shows us, number two, that we ought to praise God because there is no one like him. In other words, our hearts might pitter patter when we see our significant others. In other words, when we see individuals that we love and that we appreciate, it might bring a smile to our face. But Nehemiah says we ought to praise God because there is no one like our God. And if I had time tonight, I'd ask the question, does anybody know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is nobody like our God? Is there anybody who can testify tonight that we serve a God who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? There's nobody like our God. Watch this. Nehemiah says we ought to be intentional about praise because of God's name. We ought to be intentional about praise because there's no one like God. But then lastly, Nehemiah says we ought to praise God because no one can do what God can do. I'm, 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 I'm almost done. L- listen, uh, when, 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 when I was candidating for Beulah, I remember on my first trip that there was an individual uh, who was singing in the choir. And I've had this conversation with this individual. Matter of fact, I had it earlier today. I was looking at this individual and seeing how they were engaging in the choir. And my first initial thought when I was still a candidate for Beulah was that this person was flashy and tried to bring attention to themselves. Later on, I discovered that this same individual had cancer in their throat. And they were told that they would never speak again. Did you hear what I said? They didn't tell him, tell him that he would be able to, that, that, that he would be able, they told him he would never be able to speak again, let alone sing again. And so he told me, he said, Pastor Harris, he said, I know there are some individuals who when they look at me, they think I'm doing stuff for show. He said, I know some people look at me and they think I'm too flashy. He said, but the truth of the matter is a lot of people don't even know why, don't even know what I've been through. And he said, if if people knew what I've been through, they would understand why I praise God the way I praise God. And I wonder, is that anybody's testimony under the sound of my voice tonight? You can say, listen, you don't know my story. When, you, when I'm giving him glory, don't hate on me because you don't know my story. If you don't know the hell I've been through, then you ought to stay out of my hallelujah. Because how many of you can say tonight, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Nehemiah says we ought to praise God. Because we serve a God who can do what nobody else can do. When we start to think about the doors he's opened, when we start to think about the ways he's made, when we start to think about the tears that he's dried, we ought to come to the conclusion that no one can do what God can do.